So this talk had a different name at one point, but I thought it was a little too aggressive, which is that. Um, quantum computing has a hype problem. This is probably not a surprise to anyone who's paying attention. Um, does anyone know this image? It's called the Gartner Hype Curve. It's by a research firm called Gartner. And basically, it, it posits that any sort of new technology goes through this series of this like wave of hype, right? And there's like an initial trigger where there's money and interest, and then it goes up to this peak of inflated expectations, and then plummets down into a trough of disappointment. We are pretty much at the apogee of that peak right now. Uh, and I want to be super careful about this because I'm going to spend most of this talk talking about why we're not actually that close to really world changing things with quantum computers quite yet. Although we will be, there are really, really cool things we are doing right now with quantum computers. And there are, there are going to be really major world changing things that we will be able to do with them eventually. But that's not right now. Right now, we're still sort of in a messy middle period where we're trying to make really good quantum computers. And what we've done so far is made some quantum computers. Uh, so the, the headlines that are sort of happening right now, um, it's really, the, the hype is about what it is right now. Um, this is, you know, just one of many uh, media things that come up that say, okay, Google has a new chip. It has 72 qubits. That's great. The world's going to change. No, it's not. And they always come with these like ridiculous images that don't really mean anything at all. I have no idea what this is. It reminds me of like the galaxy brain thing, if you're familiar with that, uh, which is actually not a bad metaphor for what like the headlines I'm going to go through here. So quantum supremacy, how many people saw this headline or a similar one? I'll talk about what this means. Um, the long and short of it is they did probably achieve quantum supremacy, but it doesn't actually mean anything interesting. Mm. It means one interesting thing, which is quantum computers are just actually possible, uh, which we already knew. Um, we're not going to break the blockchain anytime soon. Don't worry about it. Uh, they're going to get increasingly wild, by the way. Uh, quantum computers cannot time travel will not ever be able to. I'll talk about why. Uh, this one's my favorite. It's really good. Uh, the creative Bitcoin is not a quantum AI from the future, as far as I'm aware. And so at this point, we're just in this wild phase of just crazy speculation where we don't really know. We, I mean, the general population doesn't really understand what quantum computers are right now, where we are, and sort of the progress of these things, how they really work at a fundamental level. And I think this is like for a few reasons, right? It's it's intimidating topic to dig into, right? It's this esoteric physics thing. It's weird math. And it just kind of seems like magic. And we know that it has this immense potential, right? We know for a fact that it can do a few really incredible things if we have enough power, which we don't yet. But how do we know how far away from that power we are, right? It's, it's a hard question because it's hard to predict the future. We don't know how quickly we'll make technological advances, right? And it's also just like, challenging to learn, right? I've been in a company that makes quantum hardware for a little over a year and a half now. And I feel like the list of things that I don't fully understand about quantum computing is, where'd my mouse go? Sorry. Uh, is considerably longer than the list of things I do know. Uh, and so all of that said, this talk is actually, the, the question that I'm sort of positing here is like, what do you as just sort of an audience of generally technically inclined people in 2019 need to know about quantum computing? What must you know that will change your life, that will impact your job, that will change your day to day? And I've got some really great news for you. This is the stuff that you need to know. That's it. You don't need to know anything about quantum computing right now. I could leave this talk and you'd all be fine. It will not change the world tomorrow. It will not change your life tomorrow. It will not change your life probably in the next five years meaningfully. We'll start to see interesting things that we can do with them soon, but not really. You, you don't need to know anything about this, but it's an interesting subject and I want to talk about it. I assume since you're all in this room that you want to learn about it at least a little bit. So we're going to talk about four main things here today about quantum computing. We're talking about power which is to say the promise 
of quantum computing and the reality of where we actually are against those promises. We'll talk about probabilities, which is effectively my way of saying how we're going to talk about the mechanics of how a quantum computer computes. We talk about hardware, which doesn't start with a P, but I wanted it to, so did that. And then we're going to talk about predictions, uh, how to think about the future of quantum computing and where we are right now and what that means. Power. So let's start with this. Uh, can anyone tell me the two prime numbers that make up the number 21? This is not a trick question. Yeah, it's seven and three. That's right. What about this one? Nobody? <laughs> so this is RSA 2048. This is a, a, a famously large co-prime number. What if I gave you one of them? That's pretty easy, right? You just divide. Uh, and the fact that this is hard one way but not the other is the reason it's used in most cryptography schemes. Because classical computers are really, really bad at solving these kinds of problems, uh, factoring large prime numbers, because basically they have to try every possibility uh, over and over and over and over and over. And when you have one of them, it's a very quick check to say, okay, this is, yeah, this is one of the primes. But if you don't have them, it's nearly impossible. Uh, and when I say nearly impossible, I mean on a classic computer to factor RSA 2048, it would take quadrillions of years uh, on a desktop computer with the best known algorithms. For context, uh, the universe has been around for about 8 billion years, 7 something billion years. So this is 100 trillion times longer than the age of the universe. We're probably okay on this with classical computers. It's a hard problem. Um, with a quantum computer, depending on gate speed and things, it would take a few minutes to factor these numbers. Um, so, is RSA dead? Do we need to change all of our cryptography schemes tomorrow? No. Because... This is the largest uh, co-prime that, or sorry, semi-prime, that has been factored by a real quantum computer. Oh, where's my button? There you go. We're good. Uh, because to actually do, to solve this one, sorry, that one, this one's pretty easy, that one, you would need 2,000, or sorry, 4,096 qubits. You'd need double the number of bits in the number. Um, and those need to be logical error-corrected qubits, which I'll explain a little bit later. And right now, the best anyone's done is, depending on who you ask, in the 50s of noisy, non-logical, non-error-corrected qubits. Next. Does anyone know what this molecule is? It's a favorite of software engineers, if that's a hint. It's caffeine, yeah. So... To model this, to figure out the ground state energy of this molecule, uh, you'd need to model about 160 orbitals. This is for like a pretty bad estimate, actually, but this is the number that everyone always throws around, and it has a fun analogy, so we'll stick with it. Which, on a classical computer, 10 to the 48 bits, which is roughly the same number of bits um, as atoms on the planet Earth, like in the planet Earth, including you and me in the center and all of it. Uh, we're never going to make a computer this big. Uh, on a quantum system, again, logical error-corrected qubits, 160. This is actually you know, plausible in, in the near term. So what's the practical utility of this? Why is this an incredible world-changing technology? Because of... Why don't my animations work? There we go. Because of pharmaceuticals. And because of material science. Because the Haber-Bosch process, which uh, fixates nitrogen out of the air into ammonia, takes up something like... 3% of the world's energy resources and uh, contributes a similar percentage of greenhouse gases. If we could figure out a better way to do that, that'd be huge. If we could figure out a better way to, uh, if we could make room temperature superconductors, that would be massive. That would change the world, literally. Uh, if we could model proteins and how molecules interacted with them, we, would need, we could get rid of the wet lab at every pharmaceutical company in the world. Uh, does anyone want to guess what the largest molecule that has actually been simulated on a quantum computer is today. Water. We're fine. Um, 160 logical qubits is still a ways away. And I have more bad news, which is even when we have these amazing computers in 5, 15, 30 years, they still won't solve every problem. 
Uh, they aren't some magical panacea, magic bullet, solve every problem type, type of computer. So this is um, maybe familiar to a lot of you. This is just basically the idea of polynomial and non-polynomial um, algorithm, al algorithmic complexity, right? So linear complexity is simple. It's easy. And in fact, if you tried to use a quantum computer on a linear problem, it would just make the quantum computer look bad. It could do it, but it wouldn't do it any faster than a regular computer. Now, as we move up this scale, these sort of this middle area between non-polynomial and sort of super polynomial um, problems, this is like a quantum computer's sweet spot. These are the things that we think will be very, very good. Once you get into true NP hardness, right, these are the sort of the classically intractable problems in computer science. Um, we don't actually have good quantum algorithms for most of them. In fact, the only one that we really know for sure is like molecular modeling and prime factoring, which is why it's the examples everyone uses. So quantum computers will do a lot of incredible things eventually, not soon, uh, and also not everything. So how do quantum computers work? Now, the, the thing you always hear, right, is about probabilities, right? So we can do this thing called superposition, and that means some stuff about probabilities. Um, and if you take anything away from this talk, I want it to be this. The thing, the magic of quantum computation is really not about probabilities. Uh, it's quantum mechanics, which is kind of like probabilities in a way that makes this analogy useful, but not true entirely. And I'm going to try and explain this that in a way that doesn't look like this. Uh, so we're going to start with a coin. And this is kind of the explanation you get just kind of from anyone who's trying to explain like how superposition works in a quantum computer, right? Which is, okay, you've got zero and you've got one. These are classical bits, right? Zero, one, one, zero. A computer can either be, or a bit can be in one of these two states. So what do we call the spinning one, right? It's both. It's a little bit of both. And if you were to stop the coin, it would end up on either one side or the other. And so the power of this is that, okay, with just two quantum bits, I can model all four of these states simultaneously. Uh, because, and this is kind of the only quantum mechanics, quantum physics I'm going to ask you to remember, the waves are particles. Sorry, the particles are waves. And also, they're only waves until you measure them. So what that means is, while they're still in this wavy state, right, this quantum superposition, they are all four of these in a linear combination. Um, and then when you measure them, they end up in one of these four. And you can describe these at this as a probability, right? So it's 50-50, one or zero. If you measure it 100 times, you're going to get, you know, st statistics don't work out exactly this well, but 50 of one and 50 of the other. With quantum computation, you can actually sort of put your thumb on the scale. You can, you can load the dice, right? You can actually say, okay, it's 20% and 80, and then... If I measure it five times, again, statistics notwithstanding, I'm going to get four ones and one zero. So this is kind of where most explanations of uh, superposition and quantum computing stop. It can be a combination of zero and one, right? And that's it. That's all you talk about and you move on. What if we expanded the probability idea a little bit? What if we could have a negative probability? What if we could have imaginary probabilities? Now, this is actually way more interesting and more powerful than just it's somewhere between 1 and 0. And we can actually do this without talking about quantum mechanics at all, right? So regular probability works like this. Is this familiar to everyone? There is a different kind of probability that the math works out on that's been around for a very long time called two-norm probability, right? Or uh, Euclidean norm probability, which is the square root of all of the squares of the possibilities add up to one. So we're going from this, oh, geez, there we go. We're going from this, one, zero, zero, one, two options, to a sliding scale. This is regular probability, right? So what happens if you, the Euclidean two-norm probability, you get this, right? You're not just talking about somewhere between one and zero, you're actually talking about somewhere anywhere in a complex probability space that includes imaginary and negative numbers. And the reason we can do this and the reason we use, so basically you could imagine this kind of math and do it by hand without ever dealing with a quantum particle. But 
quantum particles naturally behave like this because this is also how you describe wave functions. So this is the double slit experiment. It's very famous. Particle to particles are waves. Um, and how we know this is if you send a light source in, you've got these waves of light, and they either add together or they cancel out, and they produce an interference pattern on the screen. The screen is a measurement operation, right? So once they do that, they have to decide sort of what they are. They become a particle again. But in the middle, they're waves. And so the waviness is actually basically how you model... Uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, right. This is how you describe a wave function, right? Because you have... Um, the phase information is actually in the imaginary space when you describe uh, a wave function with Schrodinger's equation. So what that means is, you see how, you, uh, let me go back for a second, you see how we can cancel out these amplitudes to a flat line. That means that when you entangle two quantum bits together, you can actually produce output that only ever happens at one end or the other. It has an interference pattern, and then now we actually have interesting computational power. Um, so, classical computer basically check. Oh, keep doing that. Checks information like this, right? Okay, I'm going to check that one. I'm going to check that one. I'm going to check that one. So, when people talk about quantum computation, a lot of the time it's like, okay, I'm going to try everyone at once. So, since uh, based on what we've already talked about, if I were to do that, if I were to produce a, an equal superposition of all of the possible states and then measure it, what would happen? Nothing useful. I would get one of the many possible outputs. Then I do it again, and I get another one of the many possible outputs, and I do it over and over and over, and I haven't learned anything about my system or my, the thing I'm trying to compute. All I've done is encoded all of the information into a quantum system, which is cool, but not computationally useful. And so this interference thing, this ability to take these negative probabilities and have basically the probabilities of, you want basically the, all the probabilities, the right answer to all be positive, and the probabilities of the wrong answers or the amplitudes of the wrong answers to some be negative and some be positive, so they cancel out. So what you end up with is something that looks like this, where it actually leans towards it. It weights the output towards a specific bit stream, which is your answer. Um, that's kind of how it do it. So let's talk about hardware, which is the thing that I can speak more confidently to anyway. So... Here's how you make a quantum computer in five steps. You find or make a qubit, which is any two-state quantum system. You successfully isolate a bunch of them from the universe, but not from each other, for long enough to do quantum computation. You have an, a way to initialize them all to the same state, so you know what you're starting with. You have the ability to change any individual one and entangle them with quantum operations. You need to be able to measure them individually. Uh, this is actually really analogous to how you make a universal classical computer, right? You need a representation of a bit. We use electricity, right? One, zero. One, zero. One, zero. Um, but uh, you don't need the isolated from the universe part. And the reason you need to do that, by the way, is because this superposition thing, like I said, only happens when you're not looking at it. So if the universe looks at it, which is to say that anything kind of anywhere interacts with a quantum system, it loses this coherent superposition thing. It loses the entanglement thing, and then your information is lost. When you measure it, actually, your information is entirely lost, right? Because we're just getting a projection of this complex information. Uh, so there's a bunch of different ways to make a qubit. Um, there's two kind of front runners right now, uh, trapped ions and superconducting systems. And then there's a bunch of other like weirder, more esoteric ones that, uh, for different reasons, uh, just aren't as popular right now, don't have major uh, bucks behind them. Uh, some of those are uh, nitrogen vacancies in diamond, uh, uh, spin dots, which is basically where you embed two very tiny pieces of uh, some material inside of silicon, photons, and neutral atoms, which are similar to trapped ions, but um, different in that trapped ions use uh, RF fields to hold the ions in place, and 
uh, neutratoms exclusively use lasers to do that. So uh, on the left, trapped ions, the company that I work for, IonQ does this. Uh, Honeywell does this. Uh, there's a um, company in Innsbruck, Austria, that does this called Alpine Quantum Technologies, I believe. Um, there are a number of universities that do as well. Superconducting systems, all the big heavy hitters, they do this. Google does this. IBM does this. The startup in Berkeley called Rigetti does this. Uh, a handful of other ones too. Intel is messing with this, um, as well as a few other uh, things. So, superconductors. For superconductors, the qubit is a loop of wire that you get very, very cold, and you put a Josephson junction in, which is just a special type of thing. Um, and then when you get it cold enough, it just starts acting quantum, uh, which, as far as I know, is the actual scientific explanation for that. And uh, the, the sort of the challenges of this are, if you look at this huge chandelier thing, the reason all of this exists, the, the actual chip is like right about there. It's tiny. But this huge chandelier thing is because this has to live inside of what's called the dilution refrigerator because it needs to be at like 15 millikelvin, right? Which is 15 thousandths of a, um, kel a degree kelvin above absolute zero, like true absolute zero. Because if it's not that low, the motion that's produced by that heat uh, will ruin your quantum system. And they address it with microwaves. And they have a bunch of problems. So everyone for a long time thought these were going to be sort of the future of quantum computing. They were going to be the, the hardware of choice. A lot of people still do. I personally think that these belie a failure of imagination. So the reason that people think, okay, we're going to do superconductors is because we already know how to build silicon chips, right? Um, as, as long as we can figure out some of these little physics problems about how to keep them cold and keep them coherent and address them with microwaves without causing a ton of crosstalk, then we can stamp them out by the million. Problem solved. Except in reality, it turns out that we still have fundamental physics problems with um, superconducting systems. We don't really know exactly how to isolate them from the universe because, as you can see, they're physically on a chip, right? They're not going to get removed from that chip. This is, by the way, kind of the only propaganda for the company I work for I'm going to be doing. And it, this really is coming from like a true believer sense because I believe in trapped ions. I think they're a better technology. Uh, but Google doesn't. And they've made a 52 qubit one of these. And uh, they can't really entangle all those qubits very well. Trapped ions. So trapped ions, what you do is in a vacuum chamber, because you can't have anything, any molecules of air interacting with your special ions, you hit up a, a plume of some uh, element. People use calcium. People use terbium. We use terbium. You hit it with a laser, rips an electron off it. Now you have an ion. Now you can use a, an RF chip that looks like this to trap it in 3D space. And then you use lasers to uh, manipulate the qubits. So to cool them, uh, to uh, change the, to do the gates, to entangle them, and to read them out at the end. And there are a bunch of advantages I don't get into. Suffice to say, this technology is actually way more mature than it seems because this is roughly the same technology that we use to make atomic clocks. Uh, all of which is to say, this is very difficult to do, right? Every hardware platform, inclu including the more esoteric ones like nitrogen vacancies and quantum spin dots, have universal challenges, right? Most notably being isolation. Isolation from each other, isolation from the universe. Quant coherent quantum information only sticks around as long as uh, the uh, um, as long as it stays in the sort of unobserved state. And to actually just get it to do that at all is very difficult. To get it to do that for a very long time, and then also without looking at it, be able to do these quantum operations on it is very very challenging. Um, it, it similarly, everyone has crosstalk problems. Um, crosstalk problems are basically this idea that if you're trying to talk to one qubit, you're going to end up talking to all of them kind of near it for different reasons. Um, and that's a challenge. And then everyone has problems with sort of high quality spam. Uh, spam stands for state preparation, state preparation and measurement. And so uh, getting everything into that 
even zero state is very challenging, and you don't really know if you've done it right, because if you measure it, then you've ruined that state. Uh, and then measurement at the end is also similarly challenging. And there's ways around this, but it's tough. Um, OK, so last one. Um, I'm not actually going to make any sort of hard predictions about what we're going to do with any of these things, because frankly, they'll probably be wrong. We will, I will either dramatically under or overestimate. Uh, so what I want to give you is actually a context for predictions that everyone else is making, right? And specifically what quantum supremacy means and why it doesn't really matter. There's kind of three parts of this. Uh, understanding the timeline of meaningful events, understanding where we are in that timeline, and understanding how we get from point A to point B. So here's the timeline. At the beginning, there is decades and decades of fundamental research. People had to figure out how to make a single superconducting qubit, uh, trap a single ion, uh, use neutral atoms or silicon vacancies, uh, or sorry, nitrogen vacancies in diamond to uh, actually store and manipulate quantum information. Challenging. So you do that for a very long time, and eventually you make a quantum computer, as defined by being able to do gates on it. Uh, there's a company in Waterloo called D-Wave. They say they've made a quantum computer. They haven't. Uh, they made something that acts quantum and is a computer. It's different. Uh, I can talk about that more offline. I don't want to slam on them too much during a talk. <laughs> um, so you make a quantum computer. And all that basically means is that you can provably do something quantum with it. You can initialize a state. You can manipulate them. And you can read it out with some amount of uh, probability. You really only need, I mean, so depending on who you ask, I would say you have to have entanglement. You have to be able to entangle two atoms and then do something, or sorry, two qubits, and then do something interesting with them. Uh, and so the simplest version of this is called a bell pair. What you do is you basically, so this hidden imaginary thing that I was talking about, this I space, so what you do is you take two, and then you can basically encode the information from one into the other, and then they're entangled in that sort of zero, zero, one, one way. And so you make a quantum computer, and then you make a better quantum computer, you make a slightly bigger quantum computer, you make more qubits, you make better qubits, and eventually you get to quantum supremacy, which is allegedly where we are right now. Um, I say allegedly because I've read that paper, and I think they are, I think they have actually achieved quantum supremacy, but I think really what they've done, what they've truly done successfully is written a test that their machine can pass, which is an impressive achievement, uh, and is officially quantum supremacy, probably. Um, I'm not a peer reviewer of a paper, and I'm not even a physicist, uh, so I'm not going to be formally saying that, but probably we did it, and that's cool, because really what that means is that there are no physics barriers to making quantum computers. It's just an engineering problem. Now, it's an incredibly difficult engineering problem, but it's just an engineering problem, which is cool. So then, if you'll notice, just to the right of that, do anything practically useful on a quantum computer. Pretty much no one has done this. Uh, sorry, no one has done this. Uh, and I, when I mean practically useful, I'm not even talking about, um, you know, these huge prime factoring problems or modeling caffeine. I mean doing something that a classical computer can't do faster and better. No quantum computer currently has this ability. Uh, quantum supremacy is an arbitrary proof of work that proves that quantum computers are good at these certain things, but not practically useful things. Uh, we'll get there. Uh, the jump between this one and that one is probably pretty large, actually. Now, when I say pretty large, I mean single years. Uh, but I, I mean, quantum supremacy does not prove that we've done that. Uh, the next one is really interesting, too. It's make even one error-corrected logical qubit. So the big problem, like I was talking about earlier, with all of these qubit technologies is they're very noisy because the universe wants to get in there. Uh, and in many different ways, that creates infidelity. What that does is, um, over time, over many gate operations, that just completely ruins your calculation, right? Because 0.95 times 0.95 times 0.95, you know, 0.95 to the hundredth is a random number generator. But 0.99 to the hundredth is a useful computation. So that minor difference really makes a huge difference in terms of actually being able to do interesting things with these machines. So an error-corrected logical qubit is basically this idea, just like we do with classical uh, computers, where if you actually kind of take slightly more qubits than you need um, and then let them work together to sort of correct each other, to identify these problems, 
then you can make one logical qubit that is always correct, that never has these infidelity problems. And the number you need depends on how good your underlying physical qubits are. Could be 10, could be 100. Uh, and then way off in the distance is breaking RSA, which requires thousands of logical qubits. We are quite a ways away from that. Uh, if I had to take an over-under on a decade, I would say over a decade. So why is this difficult and why can't we just put like a thousand qubits on a chip and then error correct them and call it a day, right? So because this and that, which I already talked about a little bit. So fidelity is this really big problem. This is an image from IBM. Uh, and it's, it's representing this concept that they call quantum volume, which I have some trouble with because quantum volume is supposed to be this measurement of the power of a quantum computer, right? And it's two things. It's, it's fidelity, gate fidelity, and it's total qubit count, right? And so it's a two-dimensional space, um, or three-dimensional space, rather. And the, the point of this thing is you can, if you're all the way on either end here, if you increase your fidelity but don't increase your qubit count, you don't get any in in increased power. And if you increase your number without increasing your fidelity as well, you don't get any, any increased power. You have to do both at the same time, which is way more challenging because for a lot of these, actually all of these hardware systems that I'm aware of, having more qubits in the system introduces more noise. Uh, it introduces more sensitivity to the environment, to stray electrical fields, to stray microwave fields, to crosstalk, to all of these different hardware challenges. Um, and I don't like it as an actual measurement of quantum computing power because it, we should be measuring on the ability to do interesting things. Uh, but it's a useful model to, to uh, underline the idea that we have to improve fidelity and, um, and count at the same time. If you just do one, if you just, s like, okay, uh, Bristol Cone, right? The 72 qubit chip that uh, Google came out with like two years ago and then never actually published any papers on. Um, probably that was because they couldn't get the fidelity high enough. And then it's, it's just a bunch of noise. It's just a very big noise machine. You could probably use it as a very effective random ge number generator, and that's about it. So we're, uh, we're moving forward, but we're still a long way off. That's all I got. Thank you. Questions? Yes. No. Um, well, kind of. Uh, yeah, uh, in the sense that uh, I'm really not the right person to answer this question. I'm not a quantum algorithm designer, but I'll do my best. Uh, so the question for people who couldn't hear it was basically like, okay, how do they actually do the, how does it do the computation, right? How does it um, get from question to answer, as it were? And the answer is actually kind of weird. It, it effectively, what you do is you, you encode sort of the, the possibility space, uh, which is like this very complex multidimensional vector, complex vector. Um, and then you attempt to create interference patterns if you want to use the wave function analogy, which is accurate because these are wave functions. Um, use interference patterns to basically try and cancel out the wrong answers and amplify the correct answers. And so it's not really trying everything all at once so much as it's um, kind of pointing. Okay, so it's pointing towards a point on a sphere that is the possible answer space in a complex multidimensional vector space, uh, if that makes sense. It, it, it's kind of weird, right? Because um, many quantum algorithms actually don't do the thing they purport to do. What they do is tell you something novel or interesting about the information, 
right? So Grover search, which is a famous search algorithm, what it's doing is effectively over time amplifying the the likelihood of the thing that it says it is to be the right answer. Uh, Shor's prime factorization algorithm, actually what it does is it's a periodicity solving, solving problem. So what it can tell you is how far apart the two co-primes are effectively. So it's, um, it does it in a weird way that I, that's the best I can do, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, there, no, so, th yes, sorry, that is a different thing. So there are, um, which I meant to speak about, so there are these things called hybrid algorithms um, uh, or iterative algorithms, which basically are, are something that we can do with quantum computers in the near term, what we call noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum computers, NISC quantum computers. Uh, and basically what you're doing is you're using a quantum subroutine inside of a classical uh, uh, optimization algorithm. Uh, and, and so what that does is basically it, it, there's this one piece of the problem that is better suited to a quantum computer. We send that part and then we change the parameter space slightly and we run it again and we run it again and run it again. And over time you can create a, a minimum that way. Yeah, the, the two big algorithms, if you want to look it up, uh, are called VQE, which is a variational quantum eigensolver, and QAOA, which I don't remember what it stands for. A quantum approximation something. Questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I understand that quantum algorithm mm -hmm. showing a bunch of guys from the right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you create a superposition state by using gates. Uh, so the classic one is called a Hadamard gate. And it, it takes it, if you remember the block sphere, here I can pull it up. So if you remember the block sphere, which is what the name of uh, this thing is, it's called a block sphere. And it's just sort of the representation you'll most often see if you actually like pick up the Mike and Ike book. So there's a, a book, if you, if you really wanna get into like quantum inf information science in a level that even I don't fully get, because my actual job at the quantum computing company is to make the software that our physicists use, uh, <laughs> is, um, it's, uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's uh, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll tell anyone who wants to know. So um, what it does, a Hadamard gate, it basically takes you from your basis state, your zero, to this equator, right? And that is a gate. And how you do that basically is you know that the evolution in time, if you were to apply a microwave pulse to this qubit for n seconds, and you do this experimentally, this is how you figure this out. So you do this experimentally, you say, okay, it takes me three microseconds to get from zero to one, like a full population transfer from zero to one, from North Pole to South Pole. If I stop halfway through, I now have a qubit that is half zero and half one plus whatever phase I've put on it, which is the equatorial position. Um, and so that's how you do that. And, and um, that's how you do basically all of the gates. So entanglement gates, there's native gate sets change depending on the hardware. So uh, trapped ions use what's called an XX interaction. Um, and uh, I don't remember the, the interaction that uh, superconducting circuits use right now. Um, it's the same thing. You apply a pulse to two things simultaneously in a way that also um, basically talks to each other. And then you, by doing that, you basically... So, okay, so I can actually specifically describe it in trapped ions. I can't really do it in superconductors because it's not uh, the technology I work on. So in trapped ions, what you have here is you have a, a string of ions, right? They're trapped in 3D space in an RF well. And they actually, because they're all magnetically charged, they re repel each other, right? And the thing about that is that means that if I pluck this one, if I move that one, all of the other ions can feel it. Uh, they move with it, right? This is another type of entanglement. They, they, they have what's called motional mode entanglement. Uh, and what you can do very carefully 
is actually use laser beams to kick the ions to move them. So two, let's say uh, number two and number four in this chain of 10 to move the ions, right? And then you, you push them, you drive that motion exactly enough that you entangle them first with the entire chain and then you remove the motion from the chain and then they're just entangled with each other. Uh, carefully is the short answer. It's, um, yeah, it's weird. And then readout uh, for a superconducting system is, uh, it actually, it's the same for both, right? What you do is you, you hit it with a resonant uh, frequency and it's a frequency that specifically resonates with only one of the two possible zero or one states. And then what happens is some of them resonate and some of them don't. And the ones re that resonate are your ones, the ones that don't are zeros. And trapped ion system that actually results in glowing uh, atoms. Any other questions? Yeah. I know it's not the field that you, that you are talking about, but probably you are the person that can best answer this question. Sure. But how about the quantum communication? Oh, yeah. So yes, that is, that is not something that I specialize in, but I can talk about it a little bit um, in a sort of uninformed and broad <laughs> sense. Um, so yeah, uh, quantum communications. So uh, the, the basic idea there, well, there's a few, right? But basically the idea is that with these entangled pairs, like I, can s I said, you can basically encode a known state in one of them and then split them. And then that effectively creates sort of a, a novel type of, um, you're not actually communicating via the entangled electrons or photons or whatever you use. You're actually doing that to sort of prove that you're talking to the person you think you're talking to. And that creates a secure channel because there's literal quantum mechanical reasons why you can't copy or read that information out without the knowledge of the other thing. Uh, that's about as much as I can tell you about it. Um, it's the, the big challenge in that space is basically creating an entangled pair of photons and then sending them very, very far apart. Um, I know there's, there was a Chinese project that did it with a satellite recently, which is really cool. Um, but the, their signal to noise ratio was unbelievably high or low rather, um, for, you know, they, they pumped photons at this receiver, which was a huge receiver for a while and got a few positive entanglement events. Anything else? Great. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, very well depends depends on how bullish on on that early days thing you are so I would say that when I say you don't really need to know about it or worry about it what I mean is that the the space the um the field will still be very small for a very long time in the same way that like GPU accelerated computing is still, right? It's a specialized niche thing that only solves certain kinds of problems. But we will actually see if you specifically work in certain fields like optimization, anything that where you can map to an optimization problem, uh, anything where you basically have like high performance computing needs um, that actually like change your business. Uh, there will be u useful quantum computers in the next few years. Uh, and so basically the reason you would use a simulator is to learn before these things actually exist because the, the other kind of novel thing about quantum computing and specifically kind of the, the combinatoric power of, of adding qubits to a system is that it scales super, or sorry, yeah, super exponentially. Yes, two to the n to the n. Um, because for every additional qubit you add, you're not just doubling the computing power. You're actually, no, yeah, you're doubling the computing power. That's the thing I meant to say. Um, so it will, it'll be this sort of sea change. It'll be a really sort of fast moment where you'll, we'll go from having quantum computers that don't really do anything useful to 
do some pretty useful things. And then pretty rapidly after that, we'll have quantum computers that can do a lot of useful things. We're still, a w the point I was making is that we're still a ways away from, sorry, I can stay in camera view if you want. Um, we're still a ways away from doing things like breaking RSA, but that's not to say that we're not, we're very far away from doing useful things with quantum computers. I think we're very close to that. Uh, but just what those useful things are will still be very niche and very specific for, I think, quite a while yet. So learning on a simulator is a great way to sort of um, cut your teeth on real problems that uh, will be useful to try and develop novel algorithms before they're useful. Because basically every interesting quantum algorithm uh, to date has been developed before we had the power to use it. So a simulator helps you sort of understand what's going on in a way that you can do that. Anything else? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so I, they, they've done some really interesting things in, in making what's called a quantum annealer, right? So it, it's a very specific type of computer that has some quantum properties, um, but isn't what we call a universal gate set quantum computer, right? It can only basically do this one thing, which is called a quantum annealing problem. Uh, which is a certain kind of optimization problem. And if your problem can use an, a quantum annealer, rad. But if your problem needs any other sort of computational, uh, any sort of other algorithm, um, that computer can't do it. Th they also, to date, uh, haven't really, as far as I'm aware, proved any major speed ups um, against a classical algorithm or a, a classical system. So this is the other thing. You presumably want it to be faster or better in some way, and to date, it's not. Um, I want to, because I'm being recorded, clarify that I'm not speaking for my company, uh, and my opinion does not rep represent those of my employer. All right, now that I did that. <laughs> Anything else? Thanks for your time. <laughs>